Hey guys, welcome to today's live stream. I'm here in the temporary office in Phoenix, Arizona. I don't know how many more Sundays will be in this location, probably till mid-March, and then you guys will have to stay tuned to see where I go from there. <laughs> it could be anywhere. It could be Puerto Rico. It could be Dubai. It could be someplace in the United States. It could be Tanzania. It could be Belarus. It could be somewhere else in Eastern Europe. You just never really know. And quite frankly, I don't know either. I just kind of fly by the seat of my pants and uh, it's, it's worked out in the past. <laughs> but anyway, okay guys, let's go ahead and dive into your questions. Let's see, what can I pitch at the beginning of the show today? I'll pitch my new channel, Rebel Capitalist. And we do news stories over there two to three times per day. I actually missed Friday because I was tied up with a lot of other things. But usually, uh, most days, Monday through Friday, we're up there or I'm up there posting two to three times a day. So if you want my take on real-time news articles and events, check out the YouTube channel Rebel Capitalist. Okay, let's dive into your questions. Guys, I got these glasses on. I kind of so those glasses that you can see far away if you if you do this, but to see close, you got to do that. <laughs> so I'll probably be going doing this the whole uh, the whole live stream. All right, let's see. We got Aaron. Okay, Friedman says less government spending is always the cure. Kelton says the U.S. will be the exception because of the reserve currency status over under three years until collapse. What's your take? Well, oddly enough, I don't know that, well, if Kelton is saying that, it's quite ironic because that that's not really, at a certain point, the reserve currency status doesn't matter. Now, I understand it, it matters. It gives the United States a very long runway, and the United States can do this a lot longer, but it can't do it indefinitely. It can't, or else why are we working? That, that's always, I always do that in my videos and I, people accuse me of being a fear monger or whatever, clickbait, but really what I'm doing is I'm trying to take things to an extreme so that we can understand the way things work. And just for me, the way my brain operates for better or worse, it's just a lot easier for me to understand the nuance in what's happening if I take things to extremes. So, okay, let's take this to an extreme. If, if what Kelton says is true and that government spending doesn't matter in the United States, it's, it's limitless because we have the world currency status, status, then why are we working? Why? Are we, are we all just masochists? That's what I'd ask Kelton. I'd say, well, Stephanie, well, well then... Your policy, why would you want any American to go to work? That doesn't make any sense. Because you're saying that we can print or the government can spend basically limitless amounts of money. So are you just mean? Are you angry at poor people? Do you hate the middle class? Why would you force them to go to work if they don't have to? If we can just send everyone 10 grand a month or whatever, we'll all get rich and we don't have to work, then what's the point? If you're, if you're saying people have to go to work, then you must have some sort of ulterior motive. You must hate people. You must hate the poor and the middle class if you want them to work when they don't have to, right? Of course, what she's going to come back with is she'll say, well, I didn't mean that the United States could print as much money as they wanted to. What I meant is that the United States can print as much as they want to, as long as the production of goods and services increases at a rate that's consistent with the growth of the money supply. And okay, she's right. She's absolutely right. So then you say, okay, Stephanie, how, how are you going to make that happen? And she said, well, that's easy. What we're going to do is whatever the unemployment rate is, 
We're just going to spend enough money to create government jobs to get the unemployment rate down to what is effectively zero. Down to zero. So let's just say that real unemployment right now is 10%. I would argue it's higher. But let's just say that it's 10%. So Ms. Kelton would come in and say, okay, we just need to spend another $10 trillion a year, whatever the number is, to employ those, you know, however many people, let's say it's a, a 10 million people or something like that, right? So that's that's how much we have to spend. And we're just going to create government jobs for these people to produce. Really? Like, because if I look at the history of government, I don't see a lot of efficient productivity. And when I look at the history of the planet Earth, <laughs> like Russia, as an example, or communist China, when the government owns the means of production or owns X, Y, Z, usually it doesn't work efficiently. And therefore, if you're just printing money to hire people to dig holes and then fill them back up again, you're not going to be creating any more goods and services. So that's really the flaw in her argument. If you could just wave the magic wand and just say, yep, let's do an extra 10 trillion of government spending and create these jobs. And that's going to create an additional, let's just call it 10 trillion or what, however many goods and services we'd need to create to make sure there was no price inflation, that the goods and services was keeping pace with the rate of money growth, M2, broad money. And let's just say we could make that happen. Bing! Yes, mathematically, what she's saying is it works. But that is completely unrealistic in the, in the real world. In practice, it just... It won't happen. And the problem is that if you try it and it doesn't work, then you're screwed. Then you got real big problems because you, you're going to have massive runaway inflation. And then the MMTers would say, oh, that's no problem. All we have to do is just increase taxes and we'll take that liquidity out of the system. And then you say, OK, well, again, that works great on paper and in the textbook. Yeah, let's just increase the highest marginal rate to 98%. So the tax receipts go from 18% of GDP up to 50%. We'll just suck that liquidity right out of the system. No more inflation. Okay, again, in a textbook with a calculator, that works awesome. But unfortunately, people really don't work like like inanimate wooden objects on a chessboard that you just move this way and they just do that. They just do whatever you want them to do. That's not the way humans operate. So you can bump the highest marginal rate to 98%, but good luck anyone paying it. <laughs> so if they don't pay it, who cares? You're not sucking the liquidity out of the system. And if you look at tax receipts as a percentage of GDP, take a look at a chart. Go all the way back to the 1940s. So you can see when the highest marginal rates were 90% and you can see when the highest marginal rates were 25%. And look what happens to tax receipts as a percentage of GDP. Goose egg, zero, nada. <laughs> Regardless of what the highest marginal rate is, receipts, revenue stays about 18% GDP. You may say, oh, that, it's because those darn rich people, I hate them. We shouldn't allow them to get away with it. Fine. That's great. You can have that opinion. But it doesn't change the fact of the matter. And that's that you jack it so high and people won't pay it. And you may say that's right, wrong, disgusting. It doesn't matter. It is what it is. So, again, the, this whole MMT thing. And the way that Kelton lays it out, it, it sounds great. And mathematically, it works. It absolutely does. The problem is in real life, it it, it, it doesn't work. And it'll exacerbate the, the, the problems we currently have. Listen, our problem isn't that we don't have big enough government. That, that's not our problem. Trust me. <laughs> the problem is government is too big. It's, it's not that it's too small. Like, who could really argue that? I mean, think about that. Someone going on CNBC, like Kelton. See, she can't phrase it this way 
Because when you when you say it literally out loud, what she's actually proposing, it sounds ridiculous. Like no one's going to buy that. So they have to put this cute spin on it to make it seem like it's it's not only plausible. It's like, duh, why didn't we just think of that before? Of course, the U.S. isn't constrained by how much money they can spend. But when you say it out loud, what she's saying is our problem with the private sector, the problem with the private economy, the problem, the reason the private sector isn't producing enough goods and services to actually grow the economy is because government is just too small. If we only had bigger government, well, then the private sector would be booming. Think about how stupid that sounds, right? Any third grader would sit there and scratch their head and say, wait a minute, that, huh? That, that doesn't sound right. Because if that's the case, why don't we just have 100% government spending, right? If, gov if, all, if all we need is bigger government, right now, government is like 55, 56% of GDP, government spending. So why not take it to 70? Why not, why not 80? Why not 90? Why not have GDP 90% government spending? I mean, if, if, if this is true, then why are we stopping at 70%? Why not have, you know, you see what I'm saying? So then they'd say, well, it's like aspirin. You just take one. Okay, well, who's going to determine how many aspirin we need? It's going to be the inflation genie. And she's coming out of the bottle. She's going to give Kelton and Mosler the middle finger. And then she's going to wreak havoc on the entire U.S. economy, a la 1970s. If we do this, and I, and I again, I don't want to be disrespectful to um, uh, Kelton and Mosler because I think they're really, really smart people, and they they understand things a lot better, in my opinion, than a lot of them do. But I, I think it's disingenuous, especially you know I, I was I was a little more favorable toward them before I heard her on uh, Macro Voices, and I don't know if she couldn't get into some of the nuance of her argument because she's kind of angling for a political position or I don't know, something at the Fed, but boy, she really punted on almost every single one of those difficult questions. And when people punt like that and when they won't answer questions directly and they're trying to squirm out of them, you know that, okay, I, they, they probably understand the flaw in their philosophy and they just, they just can't admit it because that's their, that's who they are. That she's the MMT gal. He's the MMT guy. So it's your it's your total. It, it's it's your brand. You know what I mean? It, it's 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 who you are. It's it's what. Um, so I don't know. I don't want to go too far off on a tangent here, which I've already done. But that's that's my take on uh, on the whole MMT thing. Okay, so quite moving from Jersey to Florida, own my current house outright. Any suggestions what I should be doing now? I do I buy something now? Just a, I wouldn't, Greg. I just sounds like you're planning on selling in New Jersey. Probably a good time to sell. Uh, I would assume it's it's expensive there. It's it's by no means cheap as far as housing. When you look at it on a price per square foot adjusted for inflation, RV ratio, price to income, etc. So I would just go down to Florida, see how you like it. I'd rent for six months, a year, no rush, and just start kicking tires and seeing, you know, what areas you like, what do you think you'd be, what areas would be good for rental properties, do the the whole RV ratio, you know, the metrics I always talk about. And then I'd start kicking tires. I'd start looking at things with real estate agents and um, just seeing how you can try to find some motivated sellers. It's going to be near impossible right now, but um, it's, it's worth a shot to get out there and, and give it a shot. Okay, let's see. How did you apply your blackjack skills in marketing? Please give specific examples to teach us to do the same. Well, you've got to think of probabilities. So in blackjack, it, also the law of large numbers is crucial. So once you determine that Let's say that the probability of of staying on a on a fourteen when the dealer is shown a, a five or a six because when the dealer is shown a five and a six that's a bust hand they're most likely going to bust so if you've got like even a a thirteen you know you stay on a thirteen 
Now, if you've got, and then if you have anything where you can double down, you double down. If you've got anything you split, you split because that dealer's got a bust hand. So the probability, I don't know what the exact numbers were, I forgot. They're in, they're in, uh, the, uh, in uh, beat the dealer. But say it's 60% or it might be higher than that. But say that the dealer has a 60, 65% chance of going bust. Okay, well, you may, um, you know, you do what's correct based on basic strategy and you may lose that hand, but that it doesn't matter because you made the correct decision. And as far as the law of large numbers, you know that if you continue to do that, then because the probabilities are on your side, you don't have to worry about the fact you just lost the hand. That, that, it doesn't matter. You just keep doing that over and over and over and over again. And you, and you just set yourself up to where you can play more hands because you know that the more you play, the better chances are that you come out ahead. Okay, so how does that apply to marketing, right? So the first thing that that did is I was running a, a, a well, kind of a consulting deal with advertising and, and, and marketing with radio. And we were doing call to action advertising. And for this particular business, no one had really done the, the numbers, believe it or not, as far as the closing ratios for sales. If you have X amount of leads coming in, then how many of those pan out, right? Like if you've got a hundred leads come in, how many sales do you get from those hundred leads? And of those, uh, call it five or 10 sales, then what's your, what's your average sale? Okay, then what's your cancellation rate? Okay, then you just work through all the numbers. And then once you, and then, so how much did you spend to get those, uh, call it hundred leads, right? So then you've got your numbers out there and if you're and if you spend one dollar and bring in two dollars even if you let's say and see the big hang up there and what blackjack taught me was back in the day and you got to remember this is way before online marketing and now it seems just kind of commonsensical but before all this online marketing before you could get all the data from your website and your and google and facebook and all these things it, it, it people really didn't think through things that way, especially in, in kind of like ma and pa businesses and like small and mid-sized businesses, like 10, 15, 20 employees, stuff like that. So then what would happen in, in the past is you'd spend like, let's say 10 or 15 grand on marketing. And then that weekend you would, let's say you had a, a, a bad sales weekend and you lost money or you didn't really make enough money to justify the $10,000 you spent on advertising. Well, what most people would do is they'd be like, well, all right, I guess radio doesn't work. We got to move on. You know, I'm glad, glad we tried it, but it's not going to pan out. So what made me different, what Blackjack taught me is like, wait a minute here, wait a minute, wait a minute. Let me go back to the last five years and figure out what the sales closing ratios are. And let me figure out what the average sale is. Let me figure out what the, you know, the if we have a cancellation rate or something like that. And then you work the, you reverse engineer the numbers. And then let's say you have that same weekend where you spend the 10 or 15 grand and it doesn't really pan out, but you see that the, the closing ratios were 5% when they're typically, you know, if you average them out over the whole year, they're at 10%. So then you'd know, okay, well, no, it wasn't the marketing. Just keep putting the pedal to the metal because the next weekend or the weekend after, the, the law of large numbers is going to kick in to where instead of having a 5% closing ratio, you're going to have a 15% closing ratio. See? And so then once I, I knew that I could spend a dollar and make $2 in return because of everything I learned in blackjack, then the only question was how much money can I spend in marketing? Let's just, I mean, let's jam, let's rock and roll here. So if I'm spending 10 grand, I'm not going to use profanity, but I would say F it, let's spend a hundred. If I'm spending a hundred and I'm still making 200, F it, <laughs> let's spend 500. Why not? You see, I think, and so most people wouldn't have the confidence to ramp up that quickly like I did. 
and be, because they they wouldn't understand it it's just a numbers game it's a numbers game as long as you're keeping your infrastructure as long as your infrastructure can handle the excess capacity or the excess lead generation the additional lead generation and you maintain your numbers then it's just a matter of how much money can you spend on the front end and that that's when in, in this particular business you know a Back in the day when I first got in that business, a, a good month was like, I don't know, like, like 150 in sales, like 150 grand in sales, right? And once I learned how to play blackjack, I mean, within six months, I mean, I, I, I wasn't doing 150 a month. I was doing 150 a week and, and, and even more. I mean, it got to the point where that business, we were doing my memory serves me right, we're doing a million dollars a month. <laughs> when just like a year and a half, two years earlier, like a hundred thousand a month was just awesome, right? And there's no difference. The only thing is I had the confidence to, to, to just lay the pedal to the metal and run it at all eight cylinders and just spend an obscene amount of money on marketing because I, I understood the ratios. So that's, and I, I've just, ever since then, I've always done the exact same thing. So when I started investing in real estate, I did the exact same thing. Um, I, 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 well, meaning that I looked at the whole project through the, that lens. When I started another business in 2008 or nine, something like that, uh, exact same thing. I just I, I looked at that the, the business through the exact same lens, and there you go. You're you're off to the races. So um, that's why I always say if if I, I, I'm sure I would have made money somehow, but understanding blackjack, I think I made a lot more money than I otherwise would have, and I definitely made it a lot faster. That's for sure. But you see, you you got to have a lot of. It takes a lot, a big leap of faith. It does. It's easier, you know, you can sit here and talk about it and you guys watching can be like, oh yeah, that makes sense. I do the same thing. Uh, maybe, maybe, but it, it, it really takes a leap of faith to drop a half a million dollars a month in marketing um, on a small business. Even if you if you believe it's because because some months you lose money, you see. So those money those months that you lose fifty thousand dollars, you know, for the whole month or something, or you, you drop a hundred thousand, you know, you lose a hundred thousand dollars in one month. Then all of a sudden you're like, <gasps> it's like you're playing blackjack and you just lose five hands in a row. Playing correctly. See, if you're make if you're waiting all the time, oh yeah, basic strategy. It's easy to fall. It's easy to count cards. But if you have five hands in a row, you lose. Now, all of a sudden, you're like, shoot, should I really, does this work? Maybe I shouldn't be doing this. Maybe I should ease off. Maybe I should put on the brake a little bit. See, where what I would do if I had a month where I lost 100000 the next month, I'd be like, okay, I better spend more. I'm spending more on marketing next month. I'm going to get really crazy because I would say next month, the numbers are going to improve in my favor. I know that. And therefore, it, it, it's almost like, again, it's like having um, the, 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 it's like having the deck in your favor and you just lost five hands in blackjack, but you know that there's a lot of face cards in the deck, which increases the probability of the player winning. Then you're like, okay, I'm going to bet where I was betting maybe one or two units per hand. Now I'm going to bet five units. I'm going to go balls to the wall because I know that the probabilities are even more in my favor, even though I lost the last five hands. And with the marketing, it was just because I knew the law, law of large numbers would, would pan out. And if you didn't have that faith, then you wouldn't have, uh, you know, you, you wouldn't have pressed. 
and the next month you if you would have put the brakes on maybe you only would have made 100 and then just broken even for those two months you see so it's a whole mentality and, and that's why i really struggle with people that you know on twitter when i say talk about how the market's in a bubble i mean it's obviously in a bubble come on come on and first thing that's kind of annoying is people just assume that because i'm saying that it's in a bubble i'm also saying that the market's not going to go up anymore and that those i'm not saying that i'm not i don't know how people conflate those two things so the market can be in a bubble and continue to go up that that's that that's when you state that the market's in a bubble that's not a prediction that's not a timing thing. You're just stating a, a, a matter of fact, right? And, but then, you know, the pushback that you always get is, well, it's in a bubble, but if I would have cashed out two years ago, then I would have, wouldn't have made all these gains. I would have missed out on this. Number one, as if your only two options on the planet earth are just to be full long the S and P or a hundred percent in cash. Like those are your only two options. Think about that. That's like saying, okay, hmm, I want to go out to eat tonight, but boy, there's only one restaurant on the planet Earth. And if I don't feel like eating that food, well, I guess I have to stay home and I can't go out to eat. No, that's that's insane. No one would ever say that. You, you can go out to 800 different restaurants, probably within two miles of, of your house, right? So if, if, if Mexican food doesn't sound good, if Mexican food is in a bubble, <laughs> let's say, fine, go get Chinese food, go get Greek, get yourself some hummus, whatever. You've got countless options. You don't have to be, you don't have to eat Mexican food. It's, it's Mexican food or, or nothing. It, it just, it doesn't even make sense. It's bizarre that people just think, well, I, the only stock market on the planet Earth is the U.S. S&P 500. You know, it's just, I, I don't get it. The, the one person on Twitter who said that, I said, okay, well, you know, they say, oh, George, you're always fear mongering and you're, and you're costing people all of this money because they would have been invested in the S&P 500. And look at what happened in 2020. I say, well, number one, let's remember that in March of 2020, I was buying stock hand over fist. Now, I wasn't buying the S&P, but I was buying commodity producers. And I made videos on it, for heaven's sakes. And you guys that were on my live streams, you heard me talking about it. I, I, wasn't, keeping that, I wasn't keeping that a secret by, by any stretch of the imagination, right? But I, I responded to this person. I said, okay, well, let's look at your gains in the S&P 500 over the, since 2015. And let's compare that to my gains in international real estate. Let's, let's compare that to my gains in Medellin real estate. And I can promise you my returns in Medellin real estate has blown away the S&P 500 by a mile. It's not even close. You get my point. So just because I say I think the S&P is in a bubble, number one, it doesn't mean that I'm saying that it's crashing tomorrow. And number two, it doesn't mean that I'm 100% in cash. You know, you can be fully invested while at the same time not being fully invested in the S&P. And for whatever reason, a lot of people just like they struggle with that concept for some reason. I mean, I feel sorry for them. Mexican food, at a certain point, it's got to get a little old, doesn't it? You want some variety. I don't know. Okay, another tangent. Sorry about that. Your last video, one that might get banned. Do you have feeling on timeline for these events? One to two, five years? Well, I think we're in the middle of them being um, executed, for lack of a better word, right now. And I mean, I really think we're moving into this model of a command society. I think those were Russell Napier, the, the words he used. I don't think he wanted to go as far as say, just complete central planning, communism, socialism. 
I think how he's phrasing it is a, a command economy. He, he likened it something to like, like China. The problem with that is that China has gone from zero to let's say 50 on an economic scale. And if we go to a command economy, we're going from 100 down to 50. So Chinese standard of living has increased while our standard of living would decrease significantly by getting to the exact same point from an economic standpoint, right? So I think that's what you're seeing and that's gonna be the future for the United States. I do, I totally think that the Fed and the government is gonna be more in control of lending in the future. So creating currency units out of thin air by, by the process of lending them to existence into existence, which prior to all this debt monetization has been a responsibility of the commercial banks in and outside of the United States, when you consider the Euro dollar market. So I think that because if, if the commercial banks went out and started lending aggressively, if we, if we did have a recovery, which I, I don't think we do in the economy, but if that were the case and the government was, you know, five trillion dollar a year deficits. In addition to that, I mean, you you would have inflation would you, you would see greater than the 1970s. And I don't think anyone, even the deflationists, I don't even I don't think would argue that if, if that scenario were to play out in the real world. So I think Russell Napier hit the nail on the head when he said that I don't, he doesn't think that the, the government is gonna allow that to happen. So they're gonna take control over the amount of credit creation or more control. And they're, so that's, this will allow them to continue to spend money directly into the economy and send it wherever they want, whether it's in the form of additional stimulus checks, infrastructure spending, Green New Deal, you name it. College for free, healthcare for free, whatever. They're going to be able to spend money wherever they want. And then if they see inflation running hot, then they just take that, that lending process or, or currency unit creation away from the banks and give it to the central bank so they can decrease that while they're increasing the government spending or transfer payments or, whoops, or MMT, you know, something like that. So, but keep in mind, that's, that's different than what Kelton's saying. Kelton's not saying it that way. But um, in fact, even Kelton, I think if she saw that example, she'd be like, no, 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 I don't like that at all. I don't, you know, I think she's intellectually honest to acknowledge that just any government spending isn't necessarily good. It, it's, she would say it's gotta be productive spending. I would argue that that's just impossible for the government to spend productively <laughs> over a long period of time. So that's where we would disagree. But I think that's where we're going. A, a command type of economy where th th that's more and more controlled by the politicians, by the central planners, by the government. So if you're someone like myself that believes the, uh, the, the true wealth or the measurement of wealth in the real economy is how much, how many goods and services the private sector, private sector, because that's sustainable, how many goods and services they can create efficiently is the measurement of wealth. And in this type of scenario I'm referring to, that means the productivity of the private sector is going to go down as the government spending goes up. And we are, as a society, there's gonna be winners and losers, but as a society, we are going to become gradually more poor over time. And in, it, I also think you're going to see the wealth gap explode higher. I think it's staggering right now. If for someone that only comes back to the United States for limited times, you know, and I haven't really been here for a significant period of time for probably three, four years, something like that. And for me to come back, especially and hang out in an area where I'm very familiar with, it, it's shocking the difference. It is shocking. You see 10 times more people driving $100,000 plus cars, while at the same time, you see 10 times more homeless people. 
and you see 10 times more businesses closed. It, it's, it's, I mean, it's staggering. It, it really is. And I think it's only going to get worse. And that's just going to really create massive social unrest. And also, if you look back throughout history, not just in, the, in any country, and you see the real trigger to when people start getting the pitchforks is it's, it's when they can't afford to put food on the table. People can take a lot. And we can see that with 2020 and the cerveza sickness. I mean, you can lock them in their house. You can tell them that you can't go to the beach. You can, you can pretty much do anything to people. And they'll kind of shrug their shoulders. They might bitch and moan about it, but they'll kind of shrug their shoulders. And, you know, I, like, I know Americans like to think that they're rugged and tough and the government's not going to tell me what to do. And the government's going to take my lead before they get my gold. All right, well, you can talk a big game, but what happened when the government said, we're going to lock you in your house? I didn't see a lot of people put up a fight. So my point is that people will take some crazy stuff from the government in the name of safety or, or whatever, but the line in the sand, if history is any indication is when people can't put food on the table. And what we're talking about is, is, is going to create an environment where that is very possible, where you have massive food shortages in the developed world. And the food that we do have is increasingly more expensive and people, they're spending their entire paycheck on, on rent and putting food on the table. And, and that's, where, that's where you want an RV. And you want to just go up to the mountains and just watch it from a distance. <laughs> if you, I think you, you can understand what I'm talking about. And look at... Look at these command economies. Look at what communism and socialism has done in the past. Has it ever created an abundance of food? Not that I know of. Maybe you can pick out some isolated instances, but more times than not, it creates a shortage of everything, <laughs> including food. And we could see that again today or not today but we could see that again in in the future did you hear about the g7 zoom meeting recently more qe imf offering huge dollar loans to some impoverished emerging market countries same old script will it work well I mean, I think a lot of that depends on what happens to the dollar. It's what, it's at uh, 90, 90, 90, 91, something like that. And so, I mean, if they're getting the loan at 90 and if the DXY goes down to 70, then sure, it might work. And it all depends on the terms. I mean, I, it's, that's a tough question. That, that's pretty general. I, I, don't, I don't know how you would define work. I mean, do you define that just by the country having the ability to pay it back? Um, again, I think it depends on what ha what happens to the dollar on the DXY. And you notice I'm I'm specifying the DXY because the dollar can go up and down and and all around <laughs> against different things. The dollar can go down dramatically against food and go up dramatically against the euro or the Colombian peso. So it can, it can go up a lot relative to stocks and go down a lot relative to healthcare. It's, it's a very nuanced uh, thing, this the, the price is going up and down in terms of dollars.
Can you describe a bit about your business where you were selling advertising marketing services? I've been hired to write a jingle and was wondering if you had any advice. Daniel, it's just something you got to do over and over and over and over and over and over and over again. And you start to get a sense for what works and what doesn't work. And then you just, you kind of build up like a, like a skill set. It, it's kind of like, it's an art and a science. And I started writing radio copy way back in, I don't know when it was, 2002, no, no, 2003, maybe something like that. And I just did it because I thought our ad agency sucked. And I, I, that's what I told the guy I was working for as a consultant at the time. I said, listen, your ad agency's garbage. And let's just let me write the ad. Trust me, just one week, let me write the ad. I can do a better job than this fancy ad agency that you've hired in Los Angeles. And it was call to action ads. So you can just determine how well the ad worked just by how many times the phone rang. So it was very easy to quantify. Sure enough, I wrote the ad and it worked a lot better. <laughs> and that was it. That, that was the beginning of uh, the first kind of little business I had that was relatively profitable. It was just that consulting business where I was doing media buying. And then, then I'd, I'd buy radio and, at, and uh, TV spots for businesses because I had a lot of the relationships. You know, I had national accounts with Clear Channel and Comcast and I don't even know if they're still around now. I'm, I'm assuming they are, but I had national accounts. So I, I'd get the spots at a discount and then I'd, I'd negotiate the price. And, um, and then I'd tell the, the client, you know, where they should run the ad, afternoon drive, morning drive. I get them what they call rotators. Anyone that's in the business knows what I'm talking about. And then I would uh, write those ads, but, and then I started producing TV commercials uh, for some of the, the, the people as well. But uh, it, it's just trial and error, and you got to just do it over and over and over and over again. Start listening to ads and kind of reverse engineering. So if you listen to a call to action ad on the radio, as an example, just listen to how many times they announce the phone number. And you'll notice they'll announce it at least three times. And I always thought that wasn't enough. I always like to just do overkill. But I see, I used to run 60s. I didn't like 30s. I so 30 second commercials compared to 60s, 60 second commercials, because although 60s might be double the price, I always thought you would get more than double the phone calls because you're able to, to say a lot more. And then you're able to give the phone number an, an appropriate number of times. And I always just, I always ran 60s. I always encourage the clients to do that. So my point is usually they'll mention it three times. I used to like to, mention it four to five times. And just through my experience, that always worked a lot better. That would drive more calls. And, but that's something that I had to figure out just by trial and error, but you can start just by listening to one of those call to action ads and just reverse engineering it. And then just trying to improve on that. Right. It's the same thing when I started producing the TV show in Medellin, which was the kind of the precursor to the YouTube channel. Right. We had that uh, reality show that I that I produced in, in Medellin where we were flipping the houses. It's just like an HGTV show. And I went and pitched the local network there called Telemedellin on this show. And I don't know how I did it, but I got him to green light it that, you know, you got a Spanish speaking market and I'm a gringo that's never produced a TV show in his life. I don't speak Spanish and I was not only going to produce it, direct it but I was also going to be in the show. <laughs> so figure that one out. Uh, most people obviously never would have tried, but for me, it, it just kind of made sense. But my point is that's how I figured out how to produce a, a TV show that people actually wanted to watch is I would sit there and I would watch reality show and it was brutal, but I'd watch reality show after reality show after reality show. And I would reverse engineer the editing. So every scene I would stop and I would say, okay, why are they shooting the scene like this? Why are they using three cameras here instead of two? Why are they cutting every four seconds instead of 10 seconds? 
you know, how are they doing this? And then I, I figured it out and then I implemented it into the first few episodes. And as the show, we did 13 episodes total. And as we, you know, got into those mid episodes, I started to become pretty darn good. And uh, I would argue that especially some of our latter episodes were just as good, just as entertaining as a, a reality show, one of these house flipping shows you'd see on HGTV. And I was doing it with a f fraction of the budget. <laughs> I mean, a fraction. And so uh, it's the same thing though, same thing. Just find out what's working well, reverse engineer it to figure it out, do it over and over again and improve on it. Massa, what's up my brother? We'll see you in the member live stream here soon, my friend. Okay, let's get a couple more here. I'm going to try to leave, cut it off right at an hour so I can get out and go for a quick jog before I do the, the member live stream. So will the new Biden stimulus inflate asset bubbles or juice up consumer spending and spike up Price inflation. Well, <laughs> I don't know why it wouldn't do both, Hugh. And let's keep in mind that that we're just now thinking through the one, I assume you're talking about the 1.9 trillion stimulus package that they announced. But let's remember that that's just the tip of the iceberg. I mean, even what he's saying, that's just, what does he call it? That's just the down payment or something like that. That once we roll out that, it's going to be Green New Deal time. It's going to be, it's going to be climate change initiative. It's going to be, oh my goodness gracious, who knows? And it's going to just be, if it's 1.9 now, the next one's going to be three. The next one's going to be six. The next one's going to be 10. The next one's going to be 20. I mean, where does it end? Because we all know that essentially what it is, is it's just monetary heroin. That's, that's all this is. And just like heroin, the person injecting the drug, in this case, it's the economy, needs more and more and more of the heroin to have to get the same results if that's the right word to get the same level of high to get the same feeling you need more and more of the drug and at a certain point you need more of the drug not to get high but just to function and that's exactly where our economy is right now we're not taking the quantitative easing and the money printing. We're not, it, it's not making us high. It's not improving. It's not giving the economy a sugar rush. It's just keeping it alive. That's all it's doing right now. And if, you know, it started off with quantitative easing one and Q, QE2, QE3, then it went to not QE, then QE infinity. Then it went to repo madness, and then and then it's gone to government spending five trillion in, in uh, deficit spending, which the Fed is monetizing, and the then it start then it goes to Fed buying junk debt, then corporate bonds, then the Fed buying this and this and this, and I guarantee you the Fed's balance sheet isn't going down anytime soon, and if it does, it it'll only go down for a couple months, then the market crashes and they have to go back and do even more than they were doing before. So once you start this process, you can't stop. It, it's, 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 the, it's Mises crack up boom. It is the textbook crack up boom that Mises outlined decades ago. So all you have to do is just Google Mises crack up boom and, and you'll read it and it's, word for word, spot on exactly what we're experiencing right now in the United States. And so I think, you know, that's that's kind of the direction we're going. 
and how much and how fast we'll get the the spending uh that's a different question i i don't know because see then you're taking it from an economic question to more of a political game theory question and that's i mean politicians are insane i mean they're 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 like Hannibal Lecter. So it's like trying to game theory what Hannibal Lecter is going to do. And good luck with that. It's, that's why I, I don't make investment decisions based on Hannibal Lecter. I just, I, I like to think through it and I like to use thought experiments and I like to do videos on the possibilities, but I wouldn't put my money to work because I thought Hannibal Lecter was going to print $10 trillion next year instead of $5 trillion. I, I don't think that's, that's not a prudent way to invest. I think that's just pure gambling and you might as well go play a slot machine. Okay, let me go. I'll go to some questions down at the bottom here. Do I think Harry Dent might be right about stock market collapsing as early as April? Yeah, but I I mean, sure, maybe, but I don't think you can time these things. I, I really don't. I think it's just impossible because again, you don't know what the government's gonna do. If 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 you could if you could add a crystal ball and said, okay, George, or okay, Harry, or okay, Peter Schiff, or okay, Dr. Lacey Hunt, or you know, anyone like that, here's exactly what the government's going to do for the next five years. Bam, here it is. Then you probably could game theory it and come up with some realistic probabilities where you might be able to trade. I mean, I'm not a trader. I'm just a long-term investor. But you could probably have some, I guess if you're a good trader, you, you could probably work around that. But w without that, I mean... Who knows what the policy response is going to be? I mean, think about that. Go back to 2019. Is there any way that any of us could have predicted what was going to happen in 2020? No, there's no way. Now, you could have predicted that if we get another downturn, then the Fed is going to go bananas and the government is going to spend money like a drunken sailor. And whatever response we saw during 2008, it's going to be much, much, much bigger because the problem, the underlying problem is bigger. And again, the heroin is going to, or the drug addict is going to need a lot more heroin in 2020 than they needed in 2008. So you can sit there and say, Okay, if we have another downturn or when we have another downturn, the response is going to have to be 10 times what it was in 2008. That's knowable. But to sit there and say, okay, we're going to have a downturn in March of 2020 because of something called the Cerveza sickness and the market's going to tank and the Fed's going to come out and do QE infinity. The market's going to shrug it off and then the government's going to come in and spend $5 trillion and then the market's going to be off to the races that's it, it's unknowable it's just unknowable and that's why i don't really like to invest around i like to think about it and i think it's fun to do the thought experiments but i i wouldn't put my money to work based on on timing the market right i only put my money to work buying things that are knowable or or, or using metrics that are knowable i.e. is oil cheap under $30 a barrel? Yes, that is knowable because you can just look at a 100-year chart of oil adjusted for inflation and you can see that when oil gets under $30 a barrel, it is cheap. And when it gets over $80 a barrel, usually it's kind of expensive. That is knowable. Same thing with housing, right? If you go back and look at a chart of housing um, going back to 1900 adjusted for inflation, you can see that in 2006, we were in a bubble. We were miles from the historic trend line. That was knowable information. And then in 2012, it bottomed out right on that historic trend line. 
That was knowable information. It was staring you right in the face. Now, you don't know if the price is, is going to turn around and go back up or go down another 10, 15%. That is unknowable. But you, 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 you do know that you're buying on the historic trend line, if not lower. You do know that you're buying under the cost of construction. You do know that you're putting out $75,000 to get $1,000 a month in rent. You, you do know that. And nothing has to happen. The, 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 you don't need the market to do what you want it to do in order to drive the price of what you buy 10 times higher. You, you don't need that in order for the investment to pan out because it pans out from day one. You see, I think that's the biggest difference between what I like to do and, and what other people, other people, they just like to figure out where the price is going. And then, oh, I think it's going up. So I'm going to tell everyone to buy. Oh, I think it's going down. So I'm going to tell everyone to sell. I don't, I don't do, I don't know where the price is going. I don't know where the S&P is going. I don't know, but I do know it's expensive. I know it ain't cheap. So I just like to focus on that stuff. If it's cheap, you buy it. If it's expensive, you sell it. And don't worry about where the price is going. I think that's, it may, I'm probably just stupid. So I got, I got to keep it simple, right? I'm not as sophisticated <laughs> as all those guys and gals out there that are, that are fancy and, uh, and pros and actually educated. I almost flunked out of high school. So I got to have 10% in gold and 80% of my portfolio has to pay me to own it. And I got to buy it when it's cheap. So every single month, you're just getting those checks in the mail, whether it's dividend or maybe not every month, but you're getting those dividend payments, you're getting the rent checks, you're just being paid to own it. Well, let's remember what's the best performing sector in the S&P or in the stock market since the mid 1990s let me i'll go to the bottom of the comments here and see if anyone can guess what's the best performing sector since the mid 1990s what do you think tech michael says tech any other guesses i mean that's what most people would think ah see brandon and praddock have been watching my live streams diligently. <laughs> so has Seymour. It's tobacco. Tobacco. If you would have told someone in the mid-1990s, because the mid-1990s, that's when they had all their problems and their lawsuits and, oh my gosh, the, you know, tobacco is uninvestable. Uninvestable. They're going to have billions of dollars worth of liabilities. Now they've got to put these disclaimers on all the packs of cigarettes and, and show lung cancer and everything. Oh, no one's going to buy. No, the price of cigarettes are going to go through the roof. There's no way these tobacco companies are out of business. In fact, it sounds very similar to the mainstream narrative that you hear for oil right now. And doesn't it? I mean, for those of you who are who remember back then in the mid 1990s, doesn't it sound the exact same with oil today, or especially coal? Oh, that's uninvestable. No one's ever going to use that. Everyone's going to quit smoking. The amount of liability, the government's going to come down on them. They're going to have billions of dollars worth of liability in these lawsuits and everything. Yeah, they did. But guess what that did? That eliminated all their competition because all these guys that were just all these uh, tobacco companies that were just printing money back then. Now, all of a sudden, the government creates this moat around them where people can't start new tobacco companies. There's no way because the regulations are too extreme. So, so it ended up protecting, artificially protecting Altria or uh I forgot some of the other names of them, but these these huge tobacco companies back then, right? And then what you do is you bought them when they were cheap, and then they just paying you that dividend, dividend, dividend. They're just cash cows. And every single time you get the dividends, you just reinvest it. And boom, you take those reinvested dividends, and the next thing you know, you made more money on your Altria stock 
than you did buying Microsoft or, or what. And I'm not saying you, you did because I'm just talking about the whole sector, right? But I do know that since as of like last year or so, the, the best performing stock in the entire stock exchange since 1968 was Altria, tobacco, cigarettes. So it, it's not always Bitcoin. It's not always Facebook. It's, it's not always Tesla, right? And I'm not saying that Bitcoin is comparable and I know that Bitcoin is completely different and so is Tesla and you can't really compare the two. But, but whether, you know, I'm bullish on Bitcoin, but the bottom line is everybody's bullish on Bitcoin, except for Schiff. <laughs> I mean, everybody. The, the, the key where you really make the money is when you buy things that everybody hates, that they hate it. They hate it. If you mentioned that you would that you were buying XYZ, your family would just kick you out of the house. They wouldn't even want to talk to you. Or they'd tell you you were insane. They or, or they'd have like some sort of alcoholic anon anonymous uh, like intervention where they would have to sit you down and say, Oh, Joe, whew, we really care about you and we, we think you're going off the deep end. I mean, you told us you want to buy real estate in Medellin. And we, we really think that you've kind of lost control of your mental faculties here. We, we want to talk some sense into you because you're going, to, you're going to lose all your money. If you go down to Medellin, they're going to kidnap you. No, there's nothing but drug dealers down there. We, we've got to stop you from going to Medellin and buying, and buying real estate. It's going to be the worst decision of your life. That's where you make all the money. So anything that you're thinking about buying right now, I mean, try that, try that. Try telling your family members that you're buying Bitcoin. And I'm not saying Bitcoin is going to go down. And you guys know, long term, I'm very bullish on Bitcoin. Little apprehensive short term, but long term, I'm very bullish. But tell all your friends about, about that or tell all your friends that you're thinking about investing in crypto. What are they going to tell you? Oh, dude, that's a great idea. Oh, yeah, man. I, I know this one buddy of mine. He bought Dogecoin. What, you know, he's up 700% since January. Yeah, let's, let's buy crypto. How do you do that? How do I get on exchange? I want to do that. Then go out and tell that same friend that you want to buy coal. See what he says. <laughs> and then you know what you should be buying, in my opinion. <laughs> All right. Oh, three minutes after. Let's do some shout outs, guys. I'll call it a day. I got to get out and uh, yeah, why am I sweating? Because I'm getting ready. I'm getting worked up here. I'm about ready to go jogging. So, okay, let's do some shout outs, guys. Thanks for hanging out with me. We've got James Dean, Julius Newman, Dennis N. Arthur is here. My good buddy, Arthur. Hope you're well, my friend. Mexi, Mike, Valerie Price, Chris Richard, James, oh, I said James, Zumba, Elena, Daniel J, E. White, Dan Morash, Deal Donkey on Twitter, <laughs> Brad Meserle, 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 CDG, Colorado Hikers, 7002, Robert Brooker, Umberto Palo Fox, Jared, oh boy, it all skipped on me. <laughs> Scooter and Toronto, Bill McKenna, Pratic is in the house. Uh, Nicholas Michelson, Mr. Jeremy Des Hardines, the gardens of Jeremy is in the house. All right. Gigi WBA, Dr. Silver, Poker Pierce, yes. Levy Moyers, Ray Passero. All right, guys, appreciate you hanging out with me. Make sure you check out the Rebel Capitalist channel. We'll be doing two or three videos there tomorrow. And we've got a great lineup this week as far as interviews for the George Gammon channel. We're going to have some awesome whiteboard videos. As always, you guys enjoy your evening, and I will see you on the next video.